Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to have a series of four tributes, as I said. Uh, they're going to be fairly short. Uh, we're going to st uh, start with uh, Peter, uh, Peter Marshall Blue, which is John Blue's brother. Uh, second is Judith, are you second? Yeah. Second is Frank Durden, a friend of John Blue's for 37 years. He beats my record of 35 years. Uh, then Judith Davidson, another close friend of John Blue's for about 20 years. And then me, a friend of John Blue's for 35 years. And so uh, these will be, uh, you know, five to ten minutes, just to remind you that after, at the end of the tributes, uh, you're, we're, we'll open it up to anyone else who wants to talk. And again, uh, we have the room till four o'clock, so the point would be we'll just keep mingling until about four and looking at the various displays of, of John Blue's accomplishments. So I think we'll start. I'm going to ask uh, John's brother, Peter Marshall Blue, to start things off. And uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Wow, and silence prevails. <coughs> okay, that's a bit intimidating. Um, the, firstly, thanks you, for all of you for coming. It's, uh, uh, I didn't see my brother very often in the, for the most part of the last few years because a bit louder. Are we there? Is that okay? I can't see the paper now. We'll be okay. I can work it out. Closer to you. Oh yeah, there you go. It was a technical issue that John could have dealt with. That's correct. There but I'm no good at it. Okay. So um, I, uh, John and I were um, seven or eight years apart. Um, and so when he came to Canada in 1967, uh, I would have been 17. Um, but um, the majority of all of you here this afternoon probably knew my brother in the latter half of his life and the habits and his daily habits, his eccentricity and his perversity um, far better than I did. Um, and I think we'll be hearing more of both his perversity and his eccentricity as, uh, as the afternoon wears on. Um, I met John, so to speak, sometime around 1955, I imagine, when I started realizing who was who in the world. Um, John was 12. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the English playwright Alan Bennett, who wrote a story based uh, on a true-to-life lady in the van. Uh, it was made into a movie, and it's about an eccentric who parked her van in his drive one day by his invitation and lived there for the next 15 years. Um, for the 15 years or so that John and I shared the same house uh, as my mother and father, my, John was my brother in the attic. Um, our attic was narrow, it was about 20 feet long, it was under the eaves of the roof, which sloped down to about three feet on one long wall. Um, and at that height, and with wider extensions at each end, when I was growing up, was a model railway. I wasn't allowed to touch it. The railway had papier-mâché hills and valleys, it had balsa wood houses and factories, it had tunnels and bridges, it had stations and sidings that were all laid out. Um, by one model mine, we, we, we grew up in Sheffield, which was steel and coal, uh, there was a large-scale heap of coal, interscale, it was about so high, into which there was a I can't think of the proper word for it. There was a chute. I'll, I'll, I don't know technical details like that. Into which coal would drop into the rail cars. The coal was in fact charcoal, which had been liberated by John from wartime gas masks, which were to a penny in those days. Um, and which he got from various ex-army stores. That was a habit picking stuff up that nobody else wanted, but that had been built to last a long time, um, that flourished until, well, till February 19th, 2019, I think. Um, 
After the railway was finished, although it was never dismantled for some years, John moved on to other treasures, also surplus to the army and almost all, always surplus to anyone in general, but they were still serviceable. And more often than not, were destined for the dustbins of society. You may think that I'm going too far back in history here, but I can assure you that um, many such items I found under the basement stairs, in closets, in the living room, and affixed to one wall or the other at John's house in the last couple of months. The thing was that just like those gas masks in 1955 when he was 10 or 11, every item that John came across was an item to be drawn, taken apart, examined, modified, repaired if necessary, and then put back together. I can honestly say that I never saw much of my brother in the attic. He communicated with the rest of the family by way of a 20-foot long tube of aluminum, or aluminium as it was in those days. <clears throat> I don't know how he persuaded my mother and father to drill the hole in the floor to put it through, but it came down the stairs, the side of the stairs, and it had, it was bent at one end, of course, and it was bent at the other, and my mother would shout up that it was either dinner time or lunch time, and down would come John. Where I couldn't get out, wait to get out and kick a ball, he spent most of his time in the attic. The railway gave way to radios, radios to televisions, televisions to receivers and transmitters, and once upon a time, to a particularly stunning attempt, uh, attempt at an aluminum framed foil clad airplane with a seven foot wingspan and a radio control that John designed and built because he couldn't find one small enough on the market. And the frame for the plane, all the struts were cut by hand uh, up there. They were welded together. And for that welding, it required a small portable welder. There weren't any on the market. John designed one and he built it. And I remember somebody coming over, I don't know, it was certainly before I was 17, um, uh, coming over and saying, you can't find welders that big. And we showed him one and he was quite astounded and there was my brother. Of course, when you're 10, you don't think there's anything strange about having a brother in the attic who knew Morse code and who would sit on the roof two stories up and signaled to his cousin about four miles away by Morse code uh, with a surplus to requirement signaling mirror. Um, but it was made and it was still serviceable um, and, and it was put to use at least 15 years after the war had ended. When we went on vacation, he would sit for hours on the beach watching shipping through a heavy grey metal telescope about two feet long on a tripod that he'd built for it. It was a gun sight from some large piece of artillery that Sam Poole had determined was also surplus to requirements after the war and which John found. I quickly learned of the characteristics once I started school. In grade three, I remember the teacher in an art class leaning over my shoulder, so I would have been six or seven, and simply saying, you don't draw like your brother then. <clears throat> He left school when he was 15. I went to grammar school uh, and the same thing happened. I was amazed when I told him that I was doing algebra and he gave me a, a large, long um, equation, which was Boolean algebra. And he was surprised that I hadn't learned that at the age of 11 um, because he learned it himself just sitting there. He completed a seven-year apprenticeship in printing engineering. He taught himself German. Uh, he worked in Germany for a while. And when he died, he was adequately fluent, I understand, in Japanese, both the language and the written form. The written form, of course, mesmerized him, I think. I came across a small book printed in 1998 by Sheffield University Press on Yorkshire Craftsman. It's by a fellow by the name of David Morgan Rees. And um, he wrote this in part. Craftsmanship, the skill of making things by hand of practical use rather than for decoration is a deeply personal intuitive activity which often defies the rational approach. The end result depending on the decisions made as the work develops rather than what was determined before production began. 
craftsmen are the survivors, struggling with patience and modesty against the developing patterns of society. Just butt in if you think I'm talking about anybody in particular. So, craftsmen are survivors, struggling with patience and modesty against developing patterns of society, adopting to the standards of their customers, with their work providing a touchstone of older and more formal values in an intense concern to see the job through from the raw material to the finished product, but all the while standing outside the standard of commercial enterprise. I think that summed him up quite well. To close, I feel that I have to say that the course of sorting through John's legacy of materials, thoughts and arguments, I have read much that scribbles on the backs of envelopes never opened, uh, on piece, pieces of paper that contained his drawings, crossed out, erased, written over. And over the course of 42 years in my profession, I, I was a lawyer for, for that length of time, I'd always regarded my brother as the mechanic and myself as the wordsmith. Um, having seen what he wrote, <laughs> Excuse me. It, it blew me away. And it's sad to say that um, <coughs> I only got to see this side of him as a result of his sudden death. One more thing. John came to Canada because of one person who loomed large in both of our lives, my mother's best friend, who John and I had always known as Auntie Ida. She lived in the house next door on the day John was born and emigrated to Canada not long after. John stayed with her when he came here in 1967, as I did in 1975 when I came to look for a job in Canada and again when I came to law school in Ottawa in 79. It was Auntie Ida who encouraged John, who had no high school, to think about higher education, and off he went. Ida was supposed to be here today. She was trying to come, but she couldn't make it. She'll be 100 years old next year. Um, her son is here, and her son is going to speak. Alan Barr is here, and he's going to talk to us this afternoon. So by the time we leave here, we'll have had the opportunity, or would have done had Ida been here, to access his entire witnessed history from October 15th, 1942, <laughs> till February 19th, 2019. I look forward to hearing everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Frank. Where are you, Frank? Oh, there you are. Frank Durden, long-term friend of John's, former professor at Ryerson, now Professor Emeritus, living, living the dream on the Pacific Ocean. Well, not exactly on the ocean, but oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you hear me okay? My strange Northern England accent that um, never seems to fail. Well, where to start? I've known uh, John for 37 years. And... Um, there you go. That better? Yeah. Okay. Um, he came to our life quite as suddenly as he left it. 37 years ago, I was thrashing around to find somebody to supervise research in the Yukon for a field season for eight students from Toronto who probably had been no further north than, uh, what, North York, Huntsville? And they're working in the Yukon. And a guy called Peter Adams at Trent calls me and says, I've got just the guy. Well, this guy turned up. You never associated John with power dressing, right? And he's wrapped in a British college scarf. He's got a bush hat. And he told me about working um, in the north with Peter Adams on the actual Heidelberg Island. Blew us away. And we hired him. I didn't check his CV. I, I never realized he'd never been to a British university. In fact, the scarf was probably swiped from somebody else, but it, it was impressive. We became very good friends, and in short order, he was a very great family friend. 
Um, as you all know, he was the consummate engineer. My wife was delighted to find I had a friend who could fix things. And John could fix anything and I couldn't. In fact, I think it became fairly obvious, I think my wife's dream husband would be a sort of amalgam of John Glue and George Clooney. I'll just conjure that image for a minute while I carry on. So the, the fact our old house didn't fall apart was um, largely due to John's engineering genius, except for the time he put a toilet in the basement, very proudly, and we did the first flush. And the steam came up because he'd, not a very glue type thing this, but he actually plumbed the hot water into the toilet. He was a great mentor to my daughter, always buying and giving her books on science that were way, way beyond the years, just like Peter's experience with the algebra, you know. Great books, she still has them, really appreciated them, but um, they were, and he was just wonder, a wonderful, Uncle John she called him. We travelled and adventured together in the Yukon, we drove twice across North America, hiked on Vancouver Island, and going across North America, we reveled in truck stops, Rust Belt cities, and disused airfields. That was John C. Old stuff. It was like he was trying to capture a lost pass. He loved going into the old rundown towns and so on and so forth. As we know, he was an eclectic genius. He could turn his mind to absolutely everything. And a, a, a marker of this is that we pull into a truck stop somewhere in the Midwest United States, go for a good greasy meal, come out, look at the trucks, and there's a truck carrying raisins, it's calling Kellogg's raisins, and it says raisin bran on the side. And John, John goes to chat up the driver and finds out that these, this semi-truck is carrying raisins for raisin bran. So I get back and I'm driving along and John's there on the back of an envelope with a pen. What are you doing, John? I'm just seeing how many packets of raisin bran they can get out of the, all the raisins in those trucks. <laughs> you know? And it's through John, of course, that I met the lab and John Small. In uh, November 1986, the National Student Conference in Ottawa, I'm waiting outside and there's a roaring noise and this van in some distress, pulls up right onto the sidewalk and the engine dies. And out gets John and the whole raft of the, uh, I guess, the small lab students and Marianne Douglas. The van's died, it won't go anywhere. What does John do? He gets some cones, puts a, co a cone around the van, gets a note, and writes property of Queen's University, puts it on the windshield wiper and leaves it. <laughs> this is a national capital. It's outside the National Convention Centre and it sat there for four days without being removed or blown up. It was amazing. <laughs> we made frequent visits to Kingston when I was living in Toronto and he came to, Tron uh, to Toronto. Every visit to Kingston had a predictable rhythm to it, no matter what. Don't take this the wrong way, I got sick and tired of coming to the lab. Every time we left his house, we had to come via the lab. And he had the same rhythm. We had to go through the loading bay while he checked out what was being thrown out. <laughs> right? And he'd make some, you know, sort of, Jesus Christ, look at that. That cost $20,000 40 years ago. It's in perfect working condition. It would then be salvaged and taken to 
his residence on Hatter Street and to his workshop, which you may or may not know he called the Hatter Street Centre of Excellence. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, eh? Um, and the same when he came to Toronto. No visit to Toronto will be complete without going to a junk shop down on Queen Street, something called Acme Supplies or something like that, where all sorts of redundant wartime equipment was kept. And he, he salvaged, buy stuff and bring it back. And that made his weekend. It was worth coming to Toronto. Uh, by the way, um, visits to the lab in the, this, this sort of predictable rhythm of life was followed by breakfast. And he invariably went to Morrison's or sometimes a place called the Queen's Arms. But once in a la lapse of taste, we went to a place called the Sleepless Goat that I hated and John just thought was fantastic. This was usually followed by a trip up to Indigo. This is a long time ago, as you can tell, this, this part. For him to chat up one of the women who worked in the coffee shop there and um, maybe scrounge a free coffee and uh, spend a bit of time there. In our conversations, John was such a brilliant guy and a wide range of topics. I, I won't go into them, but you all know what he was like. I won't go into that. Um, One topic of conversation, one topic of conversation was always, was always a general critique of John Small. <laughs> and how he's running the lab. And how much better it would be if he followed John Lewis's advice. <laughs> um, and then of course we drift into more serious things. He was passionate about the woeful state of the environment and the mismanagement of the environment. Then he drifted into astrophysics or something like that, and I'd be completely lost. Anyway, I think in more recent years I became saddened when people moved away, uh, such as myself and other friends, moved to the West Coast. But he came out many times to our place in Victoria, and we had a great time. Oh, he's, a, he's a good guy. Thanks, Frank. And we're going to move to Judith Davidson, who met John Blue during the ice storm. That's when I met Judith. Davidson and yeah it was actually huddling around John Small's uh, wood stove with neighbors that I met first met John um, and it was the ice storm in 1998 and that's that's a whole story on its own um, but I'm, I'm gonna share another story right now as, as Frank uh, has, had just referred to John often met up with John Small and sometimes other people for lunch on Saturday, on Saturdays downtown. And for a while I was involved in these Saturday lunch routines. And my story is about one such day. It was a day leading up to Christmas 15 years ago. And everyone had left campus um, to go home for the Christmas break, even John Small. So John Glue and I were walking on deserted streets on a Saturday, coming back from lunch downtown. And again, Frank has alluded to this, that Indigo was one of John's favorite spots. When it was first on Princess Street downtown, it, has a really, it had a really nice cafe upstairs. And John had become a regular, and he knew the staff there very well, especially the manager, Carrie. Um, anyway, we were walking back from the cafe towards campus, and we were on Clergy Street, and there was a light dusting of snow. We were beside St. Mary's Cathedral, 
and John stopped to examine something very carefully. On the lawn beside the cathedral were a series of little soft snowballs. And he said to me, hey, take a look at these snowballs and look at the little trails behind them. They are rolling themselves. Sure enough, I could see the, the little balls and their trails, and there were no footprints around. Uh, in fact, some of them were still rolling if you looked closely at them. Who else would ever have noticed them? John explained that in order for them to happen, you needed very specific conditions. You needed just the right kind of snow, the right temperature, and just the right amount of wind. They are rare phenomena called snow rollers. I was intrigued and impressed. And then I was really excited. I wanted to shout. I wanted the whole city of Kingston to know about these little snowballs. I wanted the press to come and interview John about these snowballs. I even phoned the Whig Standard, but their photographer was off for Christmas. Yeah, it was Christmas time and no one was around. And these wondrous snow rollers are fleeting things. So it turned out that I, it was only I who had the, the good fortune to be with John at just that certain moment to witness these amazing snowballs. What a fascination with nature he had and what a base of knowledge. He taught us so much, not in a teacherly way, but in, as a friend, an easygoing, unassuming friend. And I know many of us here have learned a lot about observation from John, about how stopping to look, really look, helps us to understand, or at least marvel at, the way things work. Cheers, John. We will miss you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, one advantage of coming at the end is that a lot has already been said about John. It's somewhat ironic we're having this memorial or celebration of life in this atrium. Every time John Glue walked through this atrium, he would rant about what a complete waste of space this was <laughs> and how this could have made such a beautiful workshop. But he's told there isn't enough room in this building to have a state-of-the-art workshop but they can bring in trees that would die outside, inside, in a biology building. But I met John uh, when I was in my 20s, actually, within a few weeks of getting my professorship here at Queen's University in this building. And I just happened to be in the geography department in Macquarie down the street. Uh, as noted earlier in, in the biography that you have in the pamphlet, John came to Queen's as a graduate student, but as a mature student, and by mature, I mean he was in his 40s. Uh, and uh, so he, when I first met him, uh, I bumped into him by accident in a graduate student office that he, you know, he shared with a number of other students that I, I also knew. And I can still recall how different he seemed from all the other graduate students. Now, partly was that he was about 20 years older, but uh, while all the, the other graduate students were there with journal articles and so on, John Glue had a a drawing board, well, there's a drawing board of his down there to the right, to my right, and he was inking in a very intricate technical drawing and surrounded by pieces of electronics, cameras, uh, and other types of mechanical pieces. He was already at that time making new equipment. In this case, I believe it was a prototype for a camera to take pictures in a deep water fjords off of Pangertong in Nunavut. Uh, and it was uh, already at this time, he was already combining his skills, which were remarkable in these different areas. Uh, he then, once I got to know him, he then started visiting my lab very frequently. Uh, I always suspected because I had a lot of women in my lab. But I slowly got to get, get him known better, better, as, uh, at first just casually, but then as a close friend. Uh, I do very well remember my first professional interaction with John, and that actually paid him or hired him to do something. It was very early uh, in my days here at Queen's. Um, it, I had a, during my PhD thesis, I had developed a very simple idea, it was, it was controversial at the time, but 
not really very complicated, simply that in tracking climate change in the Arctic, we can, because of our diatoms, we can track the extent of ice cover, which is linked to climate factors. And I'd, I'd draw, I had this, what I thought was a beautiful drawing I was about to submit uh, to, to a journal publication. And I, I proudly showed it to John that, you know, I can make drawings too. Um, I can still recall the look on his face when he looked at the drawing. Uh, it reminds me a bit of when we might be going out to, for dinner or something and Julie looks at me and says, is that what you're planning on wearing? And John was looking at it as, is that what you're planning on submitting with this paper? And uh, I knew the, just like I'm talking to Julie, I know the answer is no, but I'm not sure why it's no. So you try and get out of it. And I said, well, no, I mean, like, it's a, it's a draft. I was quite proud of it. But he says, he says, what do you want? He says, like, maybe I can do something with it. So he walked away with it. About two days later, he came back with a drawing, one of those drawings that's now posted over there of the ice cover. Uh, it did look somewhat different than my awkward figure that I was quite proud of. It's been reproduced in papers around the world in many textbooks uh, since that day. So that was my first professional interaction with John. He was still a graduate student over in, in geography, and that was over three days ago. Uh, since then, John has illustrated all my books. Some of them, the cyst atlases are over there with some remarkable drawings. Um, uh, Barb Zeeb is here. She's an author on, on one of those, a lead, lead, lead on one of those, my paleolimnology textbooks, among many other volumes. So, but John had remarkable skills that we in the Pearl Lab were able to exploit in addition to his artwork and drawing, most notably what he's mo probably most famous for is instrument development. John is best known for his glue cores. Again, many of them are sitting over there. There's many different varieties. These, these devices are used around the world. They're actually used on all seven continents. And uh, he, in addition, he actually published these, uh, these cores so they can be used by many other people. And some of these publications have several hundred citations. Not surprisingly, John was an inaugural winner of the International Paleolimnology Association Service Award, which, he was, which was presented to him in Glasgow in 2012, and his citation read, for dedicated work in developing and improving new cores and samplers used by paleolimnologists worldwide. As mentioned earlier, John's remarkable mechanical skills were indispensable in the field. For many of my high Arctic, high Arctic field seasons, he was my right hand and often my left hand as well. He could fix almost anything from field gear to small motors to electrical equipment to infrastructure that's been pulled apart by polar bears. I can well recall my first high arctic field season with John. Uh, as many of the room know, when you go to a high arctic season, logistical restraints seem to challenge, seem to drive everything. And a lot of it is on the amount of weight you can bring into a helicopter or a twin otter. So we're always trying to minimize the luggage. We were about to leave for Ottawa to get our flights first to Iqaluit and then to Resolute, then onwards. And each of us had our two personal bags, which will be our bags for the next, uh, next month in the high arctic. But look at John, and John's holding only one small bag. I suddenly gone concerned, thinking that I'm going to be sharing very close quarters with John for a month or so, and wondering how many pairs of socks he might have in that one small personal bag. I asked him, Do you, would you want to bring a second bag of clothes? We're going to be up there for a month and so on. I can still remember vividly as he looked at me with some contempt and said, John, it's field work. It's not a fashion show. I just walked away. <laughs> Being a traditionalist, he also refused to wear rubber boots in the Arctic, which is kind of strange because we're limnologists. We work in lakes. Uh, and I think there's a, a very nice photograph here somewhere of the one time John Blue would depend on me in the Arctic, because when we had to cross streams, you had to carry him across, because he, you know, you know, I think there's one picture of me carrying him across the street on, a stream on Ellesmere Island. It's one of the few times he depended on me rather than the other way around when we were doing field work. But John did know the land very, very well. He was an excellent geographer. I recall when we were uh, first going to, when he was actually going to France. He was going to France actually for Bronwyn's and Alex's wedding, who are here somewhere <laughs> in the crowd, uh, in the south of France. But John was going to go alone, and he didn't really have a plan, but he was going to land in Paris and then make his way to Provence, whichever way he could, without any real schedule. 
I got a little worried about all this uh, because, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, he, he didn't seem to have any plan or any planning and I'm, I'm sort of a planner. So I suggested he takes along some of the, now this is before you, everything was on your smartphone, of course, where you can just GPS yourself and Google this and Google that. Uh, this predated smartphones. And I suggested he take something like my books. I have like, let's go France or some one of these travel guides. And I was showing John, see, every time you come to a city, it'll have a little summary of the city. Most importantly, have a map where you can go around. And the map is very useful, I find, when I'm traveling, especially when I land in a city or a town I don't know. He interjected and says, ah, John, but I do have a map, he says. And he says, I said, I do, and he showed me. So he unrolls this map. The map is the soils of France. <laughs> now this is a map, no street names, no cities, no train lines. It's a map of the soils of France. Now the first reaction as we do is to laugh, but then once you, go, once you get to know John, I could just imagine him getting off a train in some small town, going to the edge and going, hmm, very high loam content, 5% clays. I'm in the Loire Valley. You know? This is a man who always used geological features as landmarks when he's giving directions, as if mere mortals like us would know what he's talking about. Like, you go as far and you, then you turn right at the metamorphic outcrop of the Nice, not, you know, not the igneous one, the Nice, and as if we know where that was. Having John as an employee did have its challenges or at least being someone who tried to look after his paperwork and in fact very often his interests. Often ripe with conspiracy theories, paperwork was not one of John's strong points, to put it mildly. Although he always expected to be reimbursed for his expenses, he felt there should have been some honor system that he would just come back and say, I just spent $500 on coring tubes without any paperwork. I honestly think he believed that he thought things like receipts were something I invented to torment him with. I think he actually thought I collected him as some strange hobby and he, you know, he, he was actually my, my, my guy to get the receipts. One small, very recent anecdote to summarize John's contempt for paperwork was the day after he died. Uh, Peter came, t came uh, to, to see me and of course we had to do some paperwork, pensions and things like that. And Peter asked me for something quite straightforward. What is John's social insurance number? Now you would think someone who's an employee of yours for three decades, finding his social insurance number would be fairly easy. So I go to my last piece of paperwork I had with John, and I scribble down the social insurance number that he put down there. And I said, wait a second, this is John Glue. Let me double check. I went to the second piece of paperwork, a totally different social insurance number. I went to the third piece of paperwork, another number. Eventually, I ended up phoning, looking, finding his records, got his real insurance number. Simple, simple example of what John Glue thought of paperwork. He would sit there, fill out whatever number he wanted. There we go. John was an indispensable member of our lab, but also for many other people, uh, including in this whole biology department. Perhaps this was best exemplified by this year's biology graduate student scavenger hunt. The scavenger hunt occurs in the first week of September where the student council, the graduate student council, organizes a hunt for new students as part of orientation and they give them a list of things they have to find in the biology building that's important to finish their graduate work. So it's things like, well, where's the photocopier? Where's the general office? Well this year, one of the indispensable items you had to find in the scavenger hunt was find John Blue. <laughs> Although a lot of my interactions with John were in the lab and in the field, I saw him socially almost every day of my life. For example, many weekends, as was noted earlier, John and I would go out for lunch, usually to a local pub, where, as far as I can understand, the main attraction of John was that he gave him an opportunity to summarize my many failings from the previous week of being a, of my failings as a scientist and also as a human being. Usually the lunch started fairly calmly, but on some days he would openly admit, I have a lot on my mind and I'm going to get right into it. These were usually one-sided rants, occasionally punctuated by various conspiracy theories, but mostly focusing on my shortcomings. 
I will recall one lunch very vividly when in exasperation, exasperation halfway through one of his rants, I simply yelled out, John, why do you have such contempt for me as a human being? I meant this as a rhetorical question. <laughs> However, without missing a second, he went into a list of reasons why he had contempt for me as a human being. And they were all, all focusing on how I have this incredible advantage of having him as a colleague giving me advice and I'm refusing to take that advice. Usually I would back, walk back to my office after this lunch and decompress for a few hours. There was never a dull moment with John. John also had a very strict definition of what innovation was, which I clearly never filled. I recall a time when one of our principals, or it may have been one of our VP research, uh, vice principal research, put out a discussion document on fostering innovation and attracting research stars. And I'm doing these air quotes because whenever John Blue said research stars, he rolled his eyes upwards and did these air quotes. And the administration had put out this document and he asked for input on this document. John Blue decided to put in a written submission. When he mentioned this to me, I pleaded with him, can I at least proofread it? Well, that was quite the document. It went on for pages. But I will quote some of it directly, as is ingrained in my brain. And at one point in the document he wrote, I have the distinct pleasure, quote, quote, to work with one of these so-called research stars. This so-called research star wouldn't know innovation if he fell over it doing his daily run to the ship truck at lunchtime. I counseled him on maybe not making this submission to the principal. However, for one fleeting moment in my 35 years that I can recall, John actually seemed impressed with me with some technical issues, but it lasted about 15 seconds. He was looking, finding a place that sold tiny propane cylinders for a small tool he had. It required a small propane cylinder. And I told him, oh, I just bought one, and I gave him a list of places in Kingston where you can actually buy these tiny propane cylinders. He seemed perplexed that I actually knew this, and somewhat impressed, but it was very short-lived. And he asked me, why did you need to buy a miniature propane tank? Foolishly, I answered. I said, I have a small propane tor torch in my kitchen that can be used to make creme brulee. The contempt he had for this answer <laughs> was unbelievable. And I remember the, the response he gave me, staring at me coldly. You have a blowtorch in your kitchen to barbecue pudding. <laughs> Pathetic, he yelled and walked away. At one, time, one point, I had a postdoc here from Spain, Sergi, many of you know. And upon arriving, he was trying to get some of the lingo in Canada. And he asked me, what does it mean in Canada when they say someone is a character? I said, it's someone like John Glue. Okay. John officially retired a few years ago, but continued on as a part-time employee with us at Pearl. I saw him literally almost every day. I had coffee with John the afternoon he died in my house. He was argumentative and entertaining as usual. He was my closest friend and sharpest critic for 35 years. You'll be sorely missed. Thank you. So we're going to leave it open for other people. This is Alex, I think. This Alba. is Alba. Alba. Please meet you. Thank you so Thank much. Hi. I grew up despising John. My father had a job moving sailors all over Canada. And as a result, CP Rail, Canada Pacific uh, Shipping Line sent us Christmas gifts. And my father always made sure that John and Peter got the same. My dad would be visiting them in England and come back and say, 
Your toys are all destroyed and gone. His are still in their original boxes. He plays with them and he puts them back and he looks after them. When John came to live with us, he worked at Sperry Rand for a year, decided that he was going to quit and travel across Canada, and he asked me to join him. First place we went to was to Smith Falls, to the Second World War supply store. And we bought Canadian Army combat clothing. They consisted of double layers of cotton pants with a rubber inset so you could sit down where it's wet and you didn't get wet. We bought sleeping bags and sort of poncho things that we wore that went over the sleeping bags at night. We took two sticks, stuck them in the ground and flopped it over our heads and slept outside, rain or shine. We drove across Canada up the Alaska Highway down into Montana and when we got to the border, he said, how long are you to be here? And John said, depends on whether I like it or not, which caused great consternation. <laughs> we managed to talk our way back in to Montana. Along the way, we're heading up to Edmonton, and John says, there's something wrong. We're using way too much gas. And he pulled over got down underneath the car and you could see where it was dripping out of the gas tank. We pulled into, I think it was Lethbridge, and he said, you go to the store and buy some chewing gum. I'm going to Canadian Tire. I'm thinking, aren't we just going to buy a gas tank for the car? Comes back, he says, start chewing gum, give me two pieces of paper. He would bought epoxy glue rubbed the two compounds on the little bits of paper, stuck, crawled in, jammed it in underneath the car into the gas tank, sold the car two years later. Another John Glue fix. I heard somebody talk about old stuff. We're in British Columbia and we're going along a lower road and he hears we're in a town and somebody said, oh, there's an abandoned gold mine up in, in Headley. Well, there we go. We went, drove on a farmer's road towards this cliff and then we proceeded up a switchback and there was no railing and I was fearful for my life, especially when a helicopter went right down beside us. I couldn't believe it, so I grabbed a camera and got a picture of it. We get to the top and he's rummaging through the old abandoned gold shacks and he's picking up cardboard boxes with old Gillette razor blades and the like. And he proceeds to say, these are treasures. We were near Drumheller when he found a piece of petrified wood, which we lost in Montana because he decided he wanted to wash it off. And we abandoned it there and we talked years later about how it may have caused great consternation when somebody found it and decided, how did this get here? And John was a very loving and caring person, and nothing was greater for that for me. When he showed up, unfortunately, I lost my daughter last year, and John, without saying anything, had shown up, and we had a good old laugh and a cry. And I just have the fondest memories. And I am overwhelmed with what he accomplished. A young man from Crooks, where my mother was from. And she saw a great promise in both John and Peter. And we've just had a marvelous time getting to know these two young men. Thank you so much. who's a postdoc. Uh, he just started a postdoc in uh, Sackville, New Brunswick at Mount Allison. And he couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, his parents have come today 
Jane and Larry are here. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah, they've come from Fort Perry to be here. Um, so I, I told Andrew I would certainly read this for him. John Blue was one of the most interesting and unique people that I have ever met. I have never met anyone who had such assorted yet similar interests to my own, from typewriters and fonts to cats to nuclear engineering, John knew something about it all, and you never knew where a conversation with him was going to end up, but you could always learn something new. John was always thinking about other people. When he came across an article in The Guardian or the London Review of Books that he thought would be of interest to someone, the article would be photocopied onto elephant paper. <clears throat> now I asked Andrew what elephant paper was, and he said it's what John Blue called the larger paper in the biology photocopier um, because it was the best value as it cost the same to photocopy on the elephant paper as it did on the regular eight and a half by 11. Anyway, and uh, so he would photocopy it and place it on the desk or in the mailbox of the recipient and then he would always follow up later to see what had been learned. John's talents at design, drawing, and machining were immense. One need only look at a few of his drawings, technical or otherwise, to gain some idea of the precision and attention to detail that defined his work. His machine shop, known as the Center of Excellence, was a real point of pride for him. Outdated though it may have been by modern standards, John could make his equipment churn out parts as well as anything available today. And indeed, the equipment he built with those machines is at work all over the world. He also loved to build things for his own entertainment. We had been planning to build a model Stirling engine for years, but unfortunately, we never got around to that project. John was a daily fixture at Pearl an invaluable part of day-to-day -day life there. A large proportion of the equipment we used there was hand-built by him. If, someone needed, if something needed to be repaired, John was always eager to do so and would delight in the problem solving that was involved. However, more than simply building and repairing our equipment, John contributed his character and some comic relief to the lab. A coffee party, that's a quotations, coffee party, or lunch with John in attendance was never dull, especially when John Small was there so that he could be roasted. <laughs> when not at the coffee table, John often could be found on the student office computer checking his email or watching NHK World, that's uh, Japan's national public broadcaster using a speaker turned down low as a headphone. As anyone who has ever visited his biosciences office or his house would know, John was incapable of watching perfect, oh that's another quotation, perfectly good equipment and books go to waste. His office and house were a virtual museum of parts and equipment that he had found and kept for future use. From fine mass balances, to frequency generators, John had one and knew how to use it. His fascination with electromechanical machines was something that we shared in a topic of endless conversations. While John may be gone, his legacy and memory will live on for years in the science world and for those who knew him. A simple look around paleo labs in Canada would reveal more than one piece of equipment he built and knowing how well it was constructed, it will serve the field for many years to come, a legacy he would undoubtedly be proud to have. So that's from Andrew Labai. I just want to also mention that um, the cats that John Glue had, uh, Chesapeake and Ambrose, are living very happily now with Andrew in, in New Brunswick.
I'd just like to say thank you for John who, and, and for Judith and, and for uh, Kat to, for putting, and, and everybody else who I don't know, put the work into this. It certainly wasn't me. Um, I live 4,000 kilometers west of here where it's sunny and the flowers are out and the trees are blooming. And so I came here to find this having been organized. And I thank you all. John Glue's beard cutting. No, no, I don't want to get <laughs> the movie. Okay, I'll take your coat. No, I can do it like this. I can do it like this. So it's not. Right. No, you're gonna get a J flat there. No, I get one. No, because you know what'll happen? All your beard stuff will get into your coat. <laughs> so, John Glue, what, <laughs> what brings you? What brings you to the Arctic? Arctic? The best place <laughs> to get a beard. Oh, look at your hair, too. It's a bit long. It's a bit oh, long. You have to cough. Yeah, I know. It's the Arctic, so yeah. <laughs> 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 How short do you want it? No, I want it just medium. Just medium. The Sean Connery look. <laughs> okay, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do his eyebrows? Don't do eyebrows. Do you have to do that the whole time? No. <laughs> okay. I good, because it makes me nervous. Aww. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of sympathy. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just we'll do, do the, the first eyebrows. trim. Okay. Oh. We, do you want ah. them? Why don't you stop moving them? Ah. I can't stop moving them. Yeah. Remember, I can't. I won't be able to test where I am. If I don't. You won't be able to test where you are? Ah. That sounds like a <laughs> Will lot. Will you stop moving? <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Your hands are freezing. How come your hands are so okay. cold? I'll hold his. Hold his. Will you stop squinting? Your hands are warm. But just just stop squinting. Well, okay, just squint. John yeah. Luke, just relax, think Hawaii. Nice thoughts, yeah, okay? Hair right yeah. Mm. Think nice yeah. thoughts. Mm. We're no whimpering. It sounds stuff. like a lot of stuff. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even. What hurt? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway. Maybe we should just leave one so out. So far, so good. Oh. <laughs> you need to do both. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> you get, it's not, yeah, he can't be lost. Okay, we'll check in on you later. How are you enjoying your haircut, John Glue? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't talk, <laughs> sorry. It's pretty red. Mm. Shelly's going to smooth it off, though, right? Oh, it's looking pretty good, actually. We got a lot of hair off of you here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't show you. Okay. Okay, so turn turn this way. Oh, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Looks nice. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank it looks you. totally different, actually. Yeah, you do. For the better. Okay. Okay, you, I have a I have a little mirror. So John Glue. Do you have any final thoughts for Cape Herschel 2004? Yeah. I'm glad the little hut kept us safe for another season. Take a shot of it. I'll have to back up.